And a big hello to everyone. Mike Martinego of SportMed BC here. We're so glad you could join us for this SportMed Safety webinar. Today, we'll be talking about common overuse injuries. Our SportMed Safety webinar series rolls on here in all. We've scheduled a series consisting of eight webinars. We started in August of 2014, and here we are with the seventh in our series. Just before I throw it over to our manager of sports safety and event services, Paul Dwyer, want to mention if you have any questions or comments, any feedback, there's a toolbar on the right-hand side of the screen that allows you to send us questions uh, and or comments. If not during the webinar, myself or Paul will uh, respond afterwards as well. This webinar will be posted online at sportmedbc.com and our YouTube channel, uh, simply titled SportMedBC, so be sure to check us out if you happen to miss anything. For now, though, I'll pass it over to SportMedBC's Manager of Sport Safety and Event Services, Paul Dwyer, as he takes us through best practices, common overuse injuries. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to everybody for joining us tonight for our webinar on common overuse injuries. As Mike mentioned, my name is Paul Dwyer, and I'm the manager of Sports Safety and Event Services with SportMed BC. Uh, I'm also a certified athletic therapist and certified strength and conditioning specialist, and definitely one of the most frustrating things I know for myself as an athlete and for athletes that I work with is those nagging overuse injuries. So often, uh, overuse injuries can be so frustrating because a lot of the time we're questioning how did this happen, where did this come from, and uh, what did I do uh, to bring this injury on. Um, often when we have an acute injury, uh, we understand things a lot better. It's a, it's a real traumatic force, and so it makes a lot of sense. So tonight, hopefully, we can just shed a little light on overuse injuries. So Tonight we'll look at what an overuse injury is, what are some of the things that can actually cause overuse injuries to occur, and there are countless injuries we could talk about, but I'm just going to cover a few of the sort of blanket upper body and lower body injuries that, uh, that occur quite often, and then leave you with just a few strategies of how we can stay healthy, how we can avoid, avoid uh, these overuse injuries. So an overuse injury is something that differs quite a bit from an acute injury. Our acute injuries are these one-time macro trauma events, so a real excessive force that causes tissue failure, essentially. So we're looking at uh, fractures, sprains to ligaments, tears of muscle. This is something that happens um, with a lot of force and uh, generally it's an injury that's going to cause tissue failure and it will keep us out of the sport uh, generally for about six weeks while the tissue repairs. Usually it's quite obvious what the mechanism is in these scenarios and quite different from an overuse injury. So our overuse injuries are injuries that occur over time. Uh, what we do is as we exercise our body goes through repetitive micro traumas, um, and this can come in the form of uh, weight training. It can come in the form of running. It can come in the form of sport. But essentially, our symptoms will arise or intensify over time, and this can affect our bone. It can affect ligaments, muscles, tendons, cartilage, nerve tissue, our bursa. Um, a lot of the tissue in our body can be affected by overuse, um, but really. The difference is that these are micro traumas, so it's just repetitive wear and tear and strain on these tissues. So why does this occur? Um, typically our bodies have an overwhelming ability to actually handle the physical stress uh, that the body's put through. The body can undergo a natural adaptation to the physical stresses that we put through the body. It has an amazing ability to adapt and actually become stronger and more resilient to the stresses. And this process is a process we call remodeling. So the body's tissue will undergo this structural adaptation to those stresses that we put on it. And we see this uh, evident in muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth through strength training and we see it also with endurance training in terms of increased heart rate, increased VO2 max and our ability to actually deliver oxygen to our tissues with training. So with excessive stress, 
and without the ability of our bodies to actually recover, the body will fail to make these adaptations and these strength gains, and thus the body will become weakened and the tissue will be damaged. So typically what we see is the body's ability to handle these physical stresses, and we'll see increases in bone density, we'll see increases in muscle uh, muscle width, muscle strength, uh, increases in ligament strength and tendon strength, and, and our body is actually adapts to the stresses we put on it to handle those things. Um, what happens in an overuse injury is that there's an imbalance in terms of the stresses put on it and the ability of our body to recover in an adequate amount of time. So I just want to quickly go over some of the risk factors of why overuse injuries occur. Um, firstly, I want to just speak briefly about youth and growth related factors. Obviously, as a young athlete, you're still developing, you're still growing, and specifically when we're looking at bone density and bone length, there's still a lot of development happening for young athletes. So there's a lot of stresses put on the body when athletes are doing overhand throwing motions, when athletes are doing a lot of running, jumping, in terms of the long bones in the body where we have growth plates still allowing the bone to grow lengthwise. Another factor is previous injury. If you have a previous injury, you may have remaining scar tissue, decreased range of motion, weakness, perhaps poor muscle firing patterns because of not having proper rehabilitation. With previous injury, you are more susceptible to re-injuring that area or part of that kinetic chain. Another thing is level of physical conditioning. If you're entering a sport without the proper conditioning for that sport, naturally you're more susceptible to injury. Another thing is anatomical factors. Perhaps you have a leg length discrepancy. Perhaps you have a natural, uh, more lordotic curve in your lower spine. Those things are potential to have a greater risk of injury. Uh, perhaps you have a larger Q angle. This is the angle that we speak about between the hip and the knee joint. Another one is disordered eating. Naturally, our eating influences our ability to deliver energy and it also has a great impact on bone density and it has a great influence on our blood quality. So with disordered eating, we are more susceptible. And then there's all these extrinsic factors as well, how much we train. So this refers to the loads, the rate, the intensity, the duration, our training schedule, how much time we're putting into our training. Another thing is our specialization. So a lot of the time we see athletes uh, in comp competitive sport starting this sport and specializing in the sport at an earlier age than ever before. So a lot of specialization can lead to asymmetries in the body in terms of muscle function and uh, when we do the same movement over and over naturally our bodies can break down over time. Equipment is another big factor. If we're using the wrong equipment, something that's too heavy, too large, not supportive enough, we are more susceptible to injury. And then of course technique and biomechanics has a lot to do with predisposal to injury as well. So now I want to just go through some of these common upper body injuries. We'll look at growth plate injuries, rotator cuff injuries, uh, golfer's elbow and tennis elbows are commonly known in carpal tunnel syndrome, and then I'll get into some lower body injuries. So when we're looking at growth plate injuries, we're really talking about the physis in the bone. So this is a zone that's present in all our bones when we're in our youth years and up through adolescence where there's a section of the bone that's more of a cartilaginous disc and it allows for cellular growth of the bone in a uh, lengthwise uh, manner. And so what happens is these bones are put through repetitive loading and stress and they can add excessive stress to this physis and they can lead to pain and inflammation, swelling, decreased function and potentially even fracture. And we see this really commonly in the upper humerus. So as you can see here, the ball and socket joint, we have a physis right along the neck of the humerus here. And it's really common to see 
overhead athletes, baseball players specifically, pitchers in Little League may experience a fracture in this upper region or perhaps uh, just from an outstretched fall on an arm. Um, and then if you look at the picture to the right, we see a fracture of the distal radius and this is quite common with gymnastics athletes. So we're looking at repetitive loading into the wrist that causes potential fracture of the distal radius. When we look at rotator cuff injuries, a lot of the time we're looking at tendinopathy. So a tendinopathy, we're looking at inflammation um, or degradation of the tendon itself. So just quickly to go over the anatomy of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is these four small but important muscles that originate from the scapula and attach to the head of the humerus or the sort of ball and socket joint. So we've got our supraspinatus, our infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis muscles. So the function here is to hold the head of the humerus into the socket and also to perform those rotational movements of the shoulder. So turning the arm inwards, turning the arm outwards. So these tendons can become really irritated and inflamed when we're constantly doing the same motions over and over. So we're seeing this really commonly in overhead sports as well as a lot of overhead jobs. Um, and then also eccentric loads, that's that braking mechanism. So we see this really commonly with volleyball players with their spiking motion, baseball players through throwing, football players, specifically quarterbacks, uh, and a lot of overhead racket sports as well. We'll see this really commonly. And uh, essentially this can happen a lot when we're going through the same motion over and over. And this really rapid movement of throwing something overhead or swinging something overhead and the posterior muscles of the rotator cuff, they have to basically pull our shoulder back for us. So we're getting a bit of an eccentric force where this has to pull back uh, to center and uh, keep the arm from accelerating any further. Next we have our medial lateral epicondylitis. So this is our golfer's elbow and our tennis elbow. So our golfer's elbow is this irritation of the flexor insertion on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So if we go down to the elbow and we see that all these flexor muscles attach in one common insertion point on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Okay, and this usually results from resisted flexion. So we see this a lot with golfers. So we're looking at your bottom hand of your golf swing. So if you can imagine that medial spot on the inside of the forearm, um, just from the grip that goes on and the excessive flexion, um, we'll feel that a lot with uh, golfers and they usually experience this early on in the season or perhaps from hitting the ground excessively as well as hitting the ball. We've got a rapid eccentric contraction uh, when we make contact with the ground or make contact with the ball. When we're looking at lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, this is more if you can think of the backhand one-handed swing with tennis. Um, and we're looking more at the outside of the forearm where we see this lateral insertion of the wrist and forearm extensor muscles. Okay, So this is really common in tennis, disc throwing, and again with repetitive gripping uh, sports. And it's very, very common as well. Carpal tunnel is one of those things that we see often in the work world, but it can happen a lot in sport as well. This is the irritation of our median nerve that travels along the inside of our wrist, leading to numbness, tingling, and weakness in the wrist and hand. So there are a lot of different causes that could come up, but really we're looking at um, most often previous injury, repetitive motion, and it's an inflammation of the tendon sheath. So if you can see in the diagram here, these are all the tendons of our finger flexors and wrist flexors, the median nerve in here. So it's quite a small tunnel for everything to pass through. Any inflammation in here, any dysfunction can lead to irritation of that median nerve, and that's where we get that numbness, tingling, and essentially leads to weakness in the hand. And this can also be really common in gripping sports with repetitive movements. Moving to the lower body, we're going to cover 
ITB friction syndrome, osgood schlatter disease, patellofemoral pain, shin splints, and plantar fasciitis. So when we look first at ITB friction syndrome, the ITB is our iliotibial band. So really we're looking at dense connective tissue that sort of overlaps our quadricep muscles and our hamstring muscles and runs from our hip all the way down to below our knee. So this is a really common thing to get irritated with people that go through repetitive knee flexion and extension. So with that, we're talking about our runners. Um, anybody that's going through a lot of running can experience this. And uh, there can be a number of things that cause it. It can be tightness of the associated muscles. Perhaps we're bow-legged. Perhaps we're over-pronators, so our feet tilt inwards. We may have a leg length discrepancy. There could be weakness. There could be myofascial restrictions. So this is when the muscles aren't flowing well over top of each other. Perhaps there's misalignment in the pelvis. And sometimes it's caused by an enlarged lateral femoral condyle. So as you can see, some of this stuff is actually um, biological causes. Uh, but it can also be caused just by overuse and uh, lack of flexibility training, lack of strength training. Oshgood Slaughter's disease is uh, it, it's a disease that's more uh, related to adolescents and to youth. So we're looking really at the apophysitis of the tibial tubercle. So this is this bumpy bone on your tibia where your patellar tendon attaches. So what you'll experience or a youth will experience is pain and inflammation of the patellar ligament um, at the insertion on the tibial tubercle right here. So you'll feel an inflammation of the tendon itself as well as the bone starts to degrade and can, can potentially lead to uh, a, an apophyseal fracture where the bone is actually pulled away with an excessive force from the patellar tendon. So this happens typically with adolescent males. It can happen with females as well, but adolescent males between the ages of 14 and 16, this is when they're in puberty, they're growing a lot, and so um, a lot of the time uh, their bone growth and their tendon growth and strength is kind of not necessarily balanced. So it's really common in sports involving repetitive jumping, rapid starts and stops, directional changes. So sports like basketball, volleyball, soccer, um, we see this really commonly. A lot of the time we need athletes to really rest to let this, uh, this pass, and it usually does pass in time as the athlete starts to, to grow and adapt. Patellofemoral pain syndrome, this is one of those all-inclusive diagnoses for pain that's associated with the kneecap or with the patella. So there are, could be a lot of different causes here, and it's really common in a number of different sports. But it may be, again, precipitated by an existing injury or a previous injury, um, more likely to the quadriceps muscles, and it often comes on gradually. It can be a result of poor tracking of the patella within that femoral groove, and this can be the result of muscle imbalances. Uh, again, I spoke earlier about angle between the hip and the knee, so if this angle is um, a little more uh, intense, we might be more susceptible to this. Uh, perhaps there's some soft tissue restrictions or tissue adhesions in the quadricep muscles. Um, foot mechanics, if we look below the knee, this can be a problem as well, so if we have a foot that over pronates or perhaps um, over supinates, this can lead to uh, patellar problems as well. And then our running mechanics itself, and then maybe strength imbalances between the muscles of the hip and the knee. Shin splints is another overuse or repetitive stress injury, and this can be brought on by any number of sports. Uh, it's very common, obviously, in running athletes, so you see this a lot with basketball players, soccer players, people that are running over long periods of time, as well as long-distance runners or even track runners. So this can often be brought on by overtraining, um, perhaps doing too much too soon. A lot of the time it has to do with uh, footwear that's not necessarily supportive. Um, it can also have to do with training variables, so perhaps training on a really hard surface all the time or training in the exact same pattern all the time. So this is when we're looking at track athletes constantly running the same direction on the track. Um, again, foot mechanics, over pronation can be a result. And then of course lack of recovery, um, which is the case in all scenarios. 
and continuous stress to the bone and the surrounding tissue can basically cause irritation right along the periosteum of the bone. So what you feel as muscle pain is actually a bit of a degradation to the periosteum of the, uh, of the tibia. So we're looking at the anterior view here and the posterior view here. And lastly, uh, plantar fasciitis. This is something that we hear about quite often and it can arise in any different sport. And this is a irritation or an inflammation of that dense fibrous connective tissue that runs along the bottom of our foot. So this is the uh, medial arch of our foot. So this fascia, quite dense, quite thick, but it has to overcome a lot of stress from our body, basically can hold our entire weight of our body. So what happens a lot of the time is we feel pain on the medial heel or along the arch of the foot. And this, like I said, can occur in a lot of different sports. But again, some of the causes are overtraining or uh, continuous repetitive strain, uh, rapid increases in activity and perhaps in the distance that we're uh, putting into our training. And then also there are many biomechanical factors that could be leading to it. So pes planus refers to that flat foot, pes cavus referring to a high arched foot. Either of these can potentially lead to it. And then other causes are poor ankle and foot mobility and poor flexibility of our posterior musculature. So when we look at that posterior musculature, the plantar fascia is continuous with the Achilles tendon and then into the calf muscles and up to the hamstrings. And then lastly, equipment is another factor. So having gone through a lot of these injuries, there could be a number of causes as to why they happen, but ultimately it comes down to the body needing a chance to rest from the stresses that's placed upon it so that it has the time to adapt. So just to leave you with a few factors in terms of how we can stay healthy and how we can avoid potential overuse injuries. The first biggest thing is to adjust your training workload. So we want to create training schedules for ourselves that have varying intensities and durations, varying loads that are going to make us perform functionally within our sport and we must include recovery time. There has to be rest days for the body to recover. If we don't do that, we will not see strength gains, we'll not we will not see improvements and the tissue will degenerate. So our body actually needs that time to regenerate, rebuild tissue so that it can adapt to those imposed demands. So this is especially important when we're looking at youth athletes. It's really important that we adjust our loads for the youth depending on where they're at in their development. And this means their biological development. So when we're looking at children, under the age of 12, especially when we're looking at little leaguers um, or children that are serving in overhand sports, we want to limit those pitch counts, we want to limit those serve counts until they're of the biological development that they can handle those stresses. Next, we want to implement a really good strength and conditioning plan. We have to be prepared for the sport that we're going to get into, so it's key to have an off-season as well as a pre-season conditioning plan so that as you get into your sport, you're prepared for that sport, you're prepared for the demands. It's been proven that if we can train for our sport that we are able to prevent excessive injury. And this is also the case if we incorporate a proper warm-up and a cool-down within our training. So this means good dynamic stretches to warm up and a good cool-down with some static stretching to let muscles get back to the resting length. The use of proper equipment is very important, especially in young athletes. So using the proper supportive footwear, using the right size of bats, rackets with the right size grip, using the right size clubs, this can really influence how our body responds to the demands of our sport. So we really have to make sure we're going to professionals to get fitted properly. Ensure that your technique is safe and efficient. So make sure that you're consulting with your coach or consult with professional in terms of biomechanics. There are a lot of good therapists that can do good gait analysis and do an assessment of your biomechanical running movement as well as your swinging motions as well as your uh, shoulder movements. It, it definitely goes a long way in making sure that your technique is going to protect you from further injury. If you do have injury, make sure you get it fully rehabbed. So you must seek the help of a certified sports medicine professional, whether it be a sports medicine doctor, a physiotherapist, an athletic therapist, a chiropractor. 
Make sure that your injuries are fully healed before getting back to sport. This will protect you. Eat and hydrate for your demands. It's well known that tissue growth and repair is supported by healthy eating habits. We have to make sure that we have the energy there in terms of our proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and in terms of in terms of our ability to grow as youth, it's definitely important that we have a good balanced diet. And lastly, it's important to aim for a balance of strength, flexibility, and a full body function. So what we're really talking about there is making sure that our whole body is prepared for sport, that we're not going through these um, asymmetries. So we don't want to just develop strength in the front of our body, but also in our posterior muscles in the back of our body. We don't want to just develop strength and power. We want to develop flexibility so that we can adapt to any imposed demands in our sports. With that, I'll leave you uh, for today's webinar. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Paul Dwyer. I'm the Manager of Sports Safety and Event Services with SportMed BC. If you need to contact me or have any questions about today's webinar or any in the future, please contact us and I'll leave it with Mike. Thank you, Paul. Great stuff. Uh, and thanks to everyone for tuning in for tips and tools and resources, variety of information and, and info on courses and workshops and events. Be sure to check out our website, sportmedbc.com. Paul mentioned how to connect with him. Uh, for more on SportMedBC, check out those uh, addresses on the screen there, our YouTube channel, on Facebook, and on Twitter as well, at SportMedBC. Our next webinar will be later this month. Stay tuned for details on that and be sure to check back for information and updates through our website and our various social media channels. For Paul Dwyer, I'm Mike Martinego. Thanks for tuning in to this SportMed Safety webinar.